It's 8.30, 2.33, lots of people online, almost 60 people online, and we have 20 or so here. So let's start. Thank you again very much for um, coming over or watching us, listening to us, and so on and so forth. We have a pretty heavy agenda today, so I won't give you an update first. Let's you know, take care of our guests who are going to have their updates, and then we will get back to updates from sponsored programs. So first, um, Cindy, Director of IRB Administration, you want to talk about the single IRB and all of the things related to that. Well, good morning. about AHARP. We just went through the AHARP accreditation and UC Davis um, went through it with flying colors. There were absolutely no findings, which is incredible. It's, it's like something that doesn't happen. When people come to inspect an organization, they're looking to find something and AHARP wasn't able really to find anything on us. So everyone who's part of the Human Research Protection Program, which is everybody, um, should be very proud of our program. And so I'm waiting for my slides to come up. I am... <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to move the camera over to your desktop. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about the single IRB and under NIH funded studies, the single IRB is required right now if you have multi-site research that's domestic and it will human subject research that's um, conducted domestically and it's not exempt. And so we are having some technical difficulties here. They see it online, though. It's interesting. They see it online. That's what I understand. Well, I need to be able to see it to guide my talk. <laughs> They're my crib notes. <laughs> so. Well, if she doesn't hurry up, I'm going to sing for you. Hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> While we are waiting for that, you said the, the nice things about um, AHARP. Uh, I think the biggest part of the fact that things are going so smoothly is because of the fact, you know, what you have done over the last several years that you have been here. The oh. IRB, I mean, never run as smoothly as, you know, under your direction. Thank you very much for oh, that. Oh, thank you. You just didn't want me to sing, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll look over Cassie's shoulder here because I shouldn't have these memorized, but single IRB means that one IRB will review all the sites in the research. And so it could be a commercial IRB, it could be an institutional IRB. At UC Davis, we can be a single IRB. And that means that if you have a site, a study going on with 20 sites, those 20 sites will have to submit their research um, documents to UC Davis IRB for review. And so it's, it's kind of a lot of work. There we go, yes. And put it into slideshow. So this was effective January 25th, as I said before. Hi. And then here I do it. And so um, I just went over this one already. It means it means it's going to be easier, maybe in the long run. Right now, it's a lot harder. So this means that UC Davis, if we're the local IRB, we have to review the local law for each site to make sure the research can be conducted in a compliant manner and they're not going to be breaking any laws. The investigator qualifications, research resources that they have, reportable events all through the study, we'll be looking at all that, the modifications and any other local issues. And so we already know all that for UC Davis investigators, but for the external investigators, we don't know that. And so, yeah, it is a quite a bit of work. And our staff are looking kind of harried right now with it all. We do have quite a few going. And all that work costs money. And the purpose of this talk is to talk about the money. My thing is show me the money here. So 
one thing we have to have is this IRB authorization agreement before we can start anything. And it documents the responsibilities. And that's important because that's what takes the longest for single IRB. And that's what costs so much for us is trying to get an authorization agreement together. So my word to everybody right now is that if you think there's a chance that you might be doing multi-site research domestically, you might want to make sure the sites, the collaborators that you have are trying to obtain authorization agreements. And there's a couple of national ones. The best one to get onto is Smart IRB. And so write that down, Smart IRB. And when you're look, talking to collaborating institutions, that's the first question you ask. Are you registered with Smart IRB? If they aren't, strongly suggest that they get registered. That will save time and money. Because here are the rates. So we have a different rate for UC campuses. Of course, we give our sister campuses a little bit of a discount, but you'll notice the rate is based on whether or not there's an agreement. And so if you can get the agreement ahead of time and then get the research to us with the agreement, we're doing really well. But if we have to negotiate the agreement, something other than smart IRB, then it's gonna cost a little bit more. And that's because lawyers get hold of these agreements and they mark all over them. And then we have to negotiate back and forth, back and forth on it. And so we wanna avoid all that and use a standard agreement. But here are the rates. And so we charge a little bit more at initial review because that's when we're doing all that local law review and investigator qualifications, resources, and stuff like that. And then our continuing review, that's the charge for the whole year. If there's an amendment and a change to a consent form, stuff like that throughout the year, we're not going to charge for that, but we're going to charge a continuing review that just encompasses all that. This, um, this is a charge for each site for a study. So if you have a research project ongoing, you have 20 sites, then each site will use UC Davis IRB, if that's the IRB that's selected, and each site will then pay these fees, the initial fee and each continuing review fee for the life of the study. Unfortunately, well, the grant, yeah, the grant. And that's what my next sentence was going to be. Unfortunately, this comes directly from the grant, which means less money to do your research. And so you need to plan accordingly. So how do we get paid? And that's um, you develop a plan. You put the increased cost of the IRB review in the proposal. And so that just goes with the grant and it has to be in the budget. So you need your, your proposal has to identify the sites, identify the IRB if possible, and the budget has to be in there. And so when you're looking at the budget, you go back to this fee schedule for it. So the main thing to think about is if you're going to do a multi-site collaborative research that's NIH funded and there are, the sites are domestic, at least two sites are domestic, you really need to meet with the IRB. We have a reliance team that's very willing to meet with you. We can identify if we can be the lead site, if it's eligible. One thing, it could be exempt and you could go through all this and it's an exempt research and you don't even have to have all those agreements and stuff. So you don't want to do work that's not needed. And if it's not exempt, we want to get it all done ahead of time so that you're more likely to get your award and that everything will move smoothly. There won't be any hangups. One, um, sometimes it might take us three months to get an agreement and we really don't want to delay research trying to do that. Yeah. What does multi-site mean? Is it one other institution, 10 additional institutions? Multi-site means more than one institution. So if there's two institutions, the rule is um, effective. Then, If there's four institutions, the rule is effective, unless the institutions are outside of the U.S. So if they're in a different country, the rule won't apply. 
And right now it's just for NIH funded research, but other funding organizations are starting to ask for it. And so they, it might be required for other funding sources. And so the Reliance team is happy to help. And there is, we have a special email address, hs-irbreliance at ucdavis.edu. That's the people that you contact. Please don't contact me. And so I'm here for questions. I have a question regarding the, uh, the budget I have it here. The budget, uh, our proposal team would be facing these situations and short period of time to go over the proposal. Uh, the question I'm sure would come up that, um, what would happen if there is no agreement and you said that it might take three months to reach an agreement? Uh, I suppose it's safe to say that then we should in the budget use the high number. The, you know, yes, if there's no agreement, use the high number. And if you, don't know if, if you don't know if there's an agreement, use the high number in the budget. I'll, you know, be conservative here. So if there and, are two you know, other sites, basically on five years study, we, we really have to budget for two times five, so, 10 of them for the foot. You know, yeah, it's a bit and of math this, yeah right yeah just it's a big chunk of money so you know, i mean we have to be prepared for that definitely. right it's going to have budget. an impact it is um, the question is would each site budget in their sub award and we really don't want them to do it that way it'd be really easier if it comes out of the main grant Yes, um, it's going to be charged on a recharge basis, is how the charges work. Yeah. Yeah, the, so it is a recharge basis. If you think about it, suppose, if you think about it, suppose we're a lead institution and we have 20 sites. If you try to put it in your subcontractor budget, what's going to happen is uh, we send all that money out to the 20 sites, and then we have to try and bill each one of those sites to get that money back. It's a real administrative nightmare. So it's just best to budget it as recharge here for each site, and then when the IRB does a review, it's, it's just a, a recharge charge to the grant itself. Now, if um, we could also be a, an IRB lead in a proposal where we're not the lead but you know, we're, we're not the lead on the actual grant, but we're a subcontractor on that grant. But we've been selected as to be the lead IRB. In those, our subcontract budget should include all of those fees for being the IRB uh, of record, right? So you'd still budget with these, even though we're a sub, if we are picked to be the lead IRB. Um, and in, so we would just, again, charge that budget that's in our own accounts, but the actual IRB fees would roll up into the other entity's proposal in a manner that's not, um, you know, it'd be part of our subcontract to us. Likewise, if we're the lead on the grant, but the, um, the sub is the lead IRB, we need to include the, uh, their IRB fees in their subcontract budget. We don't keep that centrally, right? Does that, so... And part of your scope of work as you issue that sub is going to be, you will be the lead IRB in, a, in your budget. So there's a, there's a lot of nuances here, but uh, we got a question. Oh, okay. Chris says she's got that. And then Chris had a, had a, oh, the, the question was, it'd be really nice if Alyssa's, I don't know what that is, budget template had a line item for this so that it didn't fall through the cracks. And Alyssa, I mean, yeah, you're nodding your head and Chris Dihixabot also said we we're going to make sure that that occurs. Okay. So my next question is, can we clarify that the costs that are being incurred as a line item are also uh, assessed indirect costs 
they're not exempt from indirect costs as well in the budget. So people need to understand that too. The NIH FAQs have not directly addressed that. Nonetheless, uh, our understanding is just like other recharge costs, that yes, indirect costs would be charged on this cost. Um, so you know the IRB in our last rate proposal that went to the federal government, the cost of the IRB were taken out of the pools. So we're not really concerned that we're, we're double billing here um, because all of the IRB costs have been removed from the pools. So that's one protective item. But the other thing is in our recharge rates, there's certain administrative overhead costs that we weren't allowed to include in those rates. Um, you know, space, uh, utilities, uh, none of that. It's not a fully loaded rate. It's only a, a rate just for the people who are doing like the reliance uh, agreements and things. So because it's not a fully loaded rate, the way we would get that element is by charging indirects on the recharge. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, I'm sure there will be more questions coming down, but we have to move forward because we have another guest who has to be on campus pretty soon. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you. So uh, a presentation regarding uh, BUA. If uh, Philip, if you come over, please. Thank you. So my name is Philip Barwell. I'm with Environmental Health and Safety. I'm the Biological Safety Officer for the campus. So uh, Cassie asked me to talk about uh, biological use authorizations, what they are, when does the researcher need one. So um, here we go. So I'm going to talk about uh, just oversight. What is biosafety to begin with? Uh, le levels of oversight, both on a federal level and a local level on a campus. Uh, what are the type of biohazardous materials that are used at UC Davis? Um, what is the IBC and you know, biological use authorizations that they review? I'll, I'll uh, put up some trigger words uh, for um, if these come up in, in, in the re in investigators' research, uh, they should contact us for our uh, BUA and uh, the coordination that our group does with other groups on campus. So. Just a background on, on biosafety. Just, okay, so this is, I got this from um, uh, the Foundation for Biomedical Research. I know it's a little dated, but uh, the, the information, at least back then, didn't change. So there's a lot of progress that was uh, uh, achieved through uh, science and research. Uh, but research is not risk-free. There are, you know, as p researchers work with biohazardous materials, infectious materials, um, they themselves can, can be susceptible to those. Um, so uh, you know, they, they can work with pathogens, they can work with recombinant organisms. We want to make sure that we have proper containment of those things. For example, if someone was doing work with recombinant corn, for example, we don't want pollen from that corn to spread. Um, and so uh, we want to make sure that those are uh, contained appropriately. Um, and as I mentioned, for researchers who are working with infectious agents, uh, you know, they can get laboratory acquired infections. Um, and so we actually have uh, uh, a researcher, uh, someone working in research back in the mid 90s, her name was, was Elizabeth Griffin. Uh, she was working with uh, non-human primates and she uh, at some point uh, got an exposure uh, to her eye and uh, she actually went to get medical attention uh, for it, but the doctor misunderstood her, and so they thought it was just a, a like eye infection, with just regular uh, uh, like pink eye or something. Um, and so they gave her something, but then over the weekend she actually you know she ha she woke up, her eye was swollen, she had shooting pain in her foot, and so she went back. Um, at that point, it was discovered that she had uh, B virus. So you'll hear this referred to as herpes uh, B virus, uh, non-human primates, old world macaques have these or are, are suspected to carry these. And so uh, by that point, it was too late. Uh, and uh, the therapy she was given, uh, you know, helped a little bit, but it, it, short of it, she passed away uh, from that infection. So it's something that, 
you know, we, we closely monitor people working at the primate center, people working with non-human primates to make sure that they, they, they uh, are incorporated into the occupational health program for our campus. Um, there was, there's some, so this was in the mid 90s. There's something a little more recent. Um, earlier this decade, uh, there was a researcher in Chicago who was working with uh, an attenuated strain of the plague uh, Yersinia pestis, and it's um, called uh, PGM minus. It, the the organism has a mutation where uh, it has it doesn't have the ability to uh, uh, accumulate iron, and it's needed for metabolism. But this person, uh, long story short, uh, you know, apparently had this illness called uh, hemochromatosis, which is there's a high buildup of iron in, in that person's blood. And so even though the organism had the inability to accumulate iron for its metabolism, because of the high iron concentration in that person's blood, it enabled the, the attenuated strain of, of this plague uh, bacterium um, to cause an infection in that person, and that person died. Um, so, uh, and there are a lot of other laboratory acquired infections. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna, this is not what this talk is about, but this is just to say that, um, uh, Research is not risk-free. There, there are you know, a lot of microorganisms uh, that are being used in research that uh, could pose a threat, that pose a threat to researchers. Um, the good thing is there is a program that helps ensure the safety of, of, of the researchers and the work that they're doing and, and um, the reputation of UC Davis. So internal, external internal oversight on the federal level, we have NIH through the NIH guidelines for research involving recombinant and synthetic nucleic acid molecules, or we call it NIH guidelines for short. Um, so uh, this says if you're working, if, if you are receiving federal funding and you're for your work that includes recombinant work, you need to uh, follow the guidelines outlined in, in that document. And one of the requirements in that is that you must have an institutional biosafety committee that reviews those uh, protocols, and at UC Davis, we call those BUAs, or biological use authorizations. On the federal level, one other thing, uh, th there's more than just these two, but I don't have room to list all of them. Um, and the reason why I put this here is last week, we were just visited by CDC and USDA for, we were inspected uh, for our select agent program. So um, uh, that's another level of oversight. USDA also has oversight separately from, from the select agent program. Uh, on the state level, we have the California Department of Public Health. Uh, th they enforce the Medical Waste Management Act and they uh, visit uh, campuses within their jurisdiction to see uh, compliance to uh, the Medical Waste Management Act. And we have uh, several Cal-OSHA standards specific to, that pertains to biosafety. 5193 uh, is for blood burn pathogens. 5199 and 5199.1 are for aerosol transmissible diseases. So, um, and then on the campus level, uh, we have policy procedure 290-55 for biological safety. So just uh, to make sure we're all operating under the same definitions, uh, biosafety, in short, you can read that here, but in short, it, it is a way, how do we ensure the safety of the people working with those biohazardous materials. And so that's what biosafety is, you know, through containment and pra proper uh, practices. Uh, risk groups is what is used to refer to the organisms themselves. So it, uh, organisms have been classified uh, by the World Health Organization, and they call the, that classification system risk groups. And there are four levels. Risk group one is not known to cause illness, all the way to risk group four, that if you get it, uh, you need to make your, your affairs in order, um, generally. Uh, BS, biosafety level, or BSL, it refers to the suite of containment practices and facility features that help to contain those, those microorganisms in those risk groups. And generally, there's a one-to-one -one relationship. Risk group one require, uh, risk group one organisms require biosafety level, level one practices RG2, BSL2, and so on and so forth. Sometimes it, there's a slide, but. And uh, here at UC Davis, do you know how many BSL stores are you? Well, oh, we have, thank goodness we have zero BSL4 no, four. facilities, <laughs> um, but we have uh, 10 BSL3 facilities. So. Um, the, the most in the UC 
yeah. So it's it's a lot of facilities to keep track of. Um, and so uh, again, since we're still at the definition stage, um, uh, recombinant DNA molecules is defined by the NIH guidelines as molecules that either naturally or uh, created synthetically uh, nucleic acid molecules that can replicate in the living cell and uh, result in, in their replication. So some of the biohazards at UC Davis uh, are uh, talked about recombinant DNA. So that usually associated with that would be viral vectors. These are viruses that have been engineered. Basically, most of the genetic elements have been stripped. Um, and so they're used as a carrier for a gene of interest uh, to be inserted into a host cell or animal or plant. And then uh, we also have uh, transgenic animals, both rodents, and we actually have a large, uh, large animal uh, on campus as well as uh, transgenic. And we have a number of transgenic plants on campus as well. So um, in addition to that, uh, we also have biohazardous animals in their tissues, and even primates, I mentioned uh, the herpes B virus. Um, and then uh, sheep and goats, uh, they're usually associated, you know, they're occupational health-wise, uh, they're considered as carriers of uh, Q fever bacterium, Coxillia burnettii. And uh, if those who are doing field studies, uh, so, so some of those animals uh, are, are suspected of carrying some pathogens as well. And then uh, human source materials. So under uh, Cal OSHA standard 5193 under for bloodborne burn pathogens, um, uh, though included in that are some of the viruses that are specifically named in that standard are HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C viruses. But in addition to that, they also cover human uh, body fluids, human blood, human cells, uh, human pro blood products, and, and human tissues. And then what a lot of people normally think of when they think of biohazardous materials are the pathogens themselves, infectious agents, human pathogens, plant pathogens, animal pathogens, or, or those uh, zoonotic agents uh, that are pathogens to both human and animals. So what are the, type of, uh, the types of research that uh, need, need to have a biological use authorization? So as I mentioned earlier, according to the NIH guidelines, if you receive federal funding for recombinant work, you, you need to have that work be reviewed by the IBC, the Institutional Biosafety Committee. So uh, that first bullet uh, is covered. And any work with infectious agent studies, um, uh, whether it's pathogenic to humans, animals, or plants, that also needs to be reviewed by the IBC. And uh, work with uh, bloodborne pa pathogens or human source materials and non-human primate source materials need to be reviewed by the IBC, as well as just regular storage of those materials. So if you recall um, a few years ago, uh, there was uh, an FDA lab on the NIH campus where they discovered vials of, uh, I think it was smallpox. And so uh, it's supposed to be existing in two places in the world, right? So uh, CDC and, and Russia, but they found it at the NIH campus. So we wanna make sure we know uh, what's stored where, even if researchers aren't using them. We want to know that they exist somewhere on campus. So, you know, that doesn't happen to UC Davis. UC Davis doesn't get on the news 10 years from now. It's like, oh, we just discovered this, you know, the storage facility in UC Davis. So, um, yeah, so that would be a big oops. That would be a big black eye uh, before <laughs> for the university. So the, the IBC, or uh, Institutional Biosafety Committee, uh, as I already mentioned, is uh, dictated by the NIH guidelines. Uh, in institutions that receive federal funding for recombinant uh, nucleic acid molecule work. And here's the, the link to the document. And on top of that, UC Davis uh, specific policy 290-55 um, also is the one that says researchers working with infectious materials also need to submit a protocol for review by the IBC. So IBC membership, uh, we, need, we must have at least five members, uh, and those members must have expertise in the containment of recombinant or synthetic nucleic acid molecule um, 
uh, organ, you know, in, in organisms. And if animals are used, if recombinant animals are used, or transgenic animals are used, the IBC also needs to have a member who has expertise in the proper containment of that uh, transgenic animal. Same with uh, transgenic plants. And if the campus has uh, recombinant work that's, that needs biosafety level three or higher containment, or if the, that institution has uh, recombinant organisms that are being cultured and it's the one culture vessel is greater than 10 liters, you also need to have a biosafety officer on the IBC. Uh, at UC Davis, we have both recombinant work at BSL-3 and uh, we have uh, our RDNA uh, organisms that are cultured at greater than 10 liters. We have one at 60 and then another one at 100 liters. And you also need to have two unaffiliated members. Uh, so uh, for those of you who may be familiar with the I have to have a requirement of one unaffiliated member, uh, they've made this uh, harder for IBC by requiring two. And uh, so in addition, as I mentioned to the NIH guidelines, uh, local UC Davis policy, TNA-55, requires that uh, there must also be members uh, who have expertise in the containment of, of even non-recombinant uh, pathogens. The responsibilities of the IRB, IRC, uh, IBC, I'm sorry, um, is to mainly to review the protocols and ensure uh, that the, the campus is uh, remaining in compliance with NIH guidelines and um, our own policy and, and pertinent regulations. If there are, uh, if there's any loss of containment with recombinant organisms, uh, we are required to report those to the NIH, the Office of Science uh, Policy, immediately. Um, and uh, we also help ensure that um, uh, our, our own policies are up to date uh, when it comes to uh, working with biohazardous materials. So how does IB, IBC do this? We have um, an online uh, uh, program that we use, uh, we call it, currently we call it BIOS. I took a picture of this one because then I don't have to have an actual PI, uh, a screenshot of an actual PI to be away. Um, but uh, the, the biological use authorization is uh, submitted through, through BIO. And that's where the PI talks about uh, what is it, a, a summary of what it is that they're doing, uh, just a, 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 like a 20,000 foot view. They list the locations where, uh, that they're using for that research, specifically what are the, the biological materials that are used. And uh, they are, they're also required to identify which sections of the NIH guidelines um, apply to the work that they do, if they're doing recombinant work. And um, there needs to be a description of the experiments uh, that involve uh, biohazardous materials. There needs to be enough details in the BUA for the IBC to be able to understand what is happening and also to do a risk assessment. Um, and so once they're doing, able to do a risk assessment, then uh, they'll, they'll also look at personnel involved and what training do they have? Is there someone who maybe uh, has never worked? Maybe you know, this person was trained as an engineer, but they're doing microbi microbiology work. And so we'll look at that as well. So, uh, you know, the, the I, IBC will look at the organisms and what risk groups they, they uh, belong to, and they'll consider what is a typical containment uh, for, for this organism. But then if the experimental conditions change, so for example, if you're working with uh, bacterium like salmonella, uh, the infectious dose for salmonella is 10 to the 4, uh, and so if you're just working on it on, 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 in your lab, uh, say using a biological safety cabinet for it, and the aerosols generated will be captured by the piece of equipment, the, that's a typical containment. But let's say you're, spraying, you're, you're studying viability of salmonella in, in produce, and you decide you wanna spray it onto plants outdoors. That changes the, the, what the IBC will look at in terms of containment because you're, you're out there, you don't know if there's going to be a gust of wind, is it going to be windy that day or not? What, is, what PPE is that uh, worker wearing? So we'll look at those kinds of things. So, so 
in addition to the typical containment level, we'll look at what exactly are they doing with that microorganism and does it need additional containment? Um, we, since the, the PIs are, are expected to at least take the first attempt to uh, specify what sections of the NIH guidelines apply to the work, um, the IBC will look at that as well and, and verify uh, whether the, the sections named uh, uh, are correctly uh, selected. And then the IBC will then uh, arrive at a final risk assessment and will help determine appropriate containment for recombinant or infectious agents. So uh, just real quick, risk assessment uh, is basically make sure that everyone understands the risk and, uh, to, and to, be, to be able to work safely. So you need to know what the materials are, what are the risks inherent with those materials, and uh, as I mentioned in the previous slides, what are they doing with it that might you know, escalate the, uh, uh, or elevate the risk, or in some cases might lower the risk. The, the people who are working uh, with those uh, biohazardous materials, what, what is their training level? What equipment are they using? So uh, IBC will even ask, like, are you using a biosafety cabinet? Are you using safely engineered sharps? Are you, um, are you, anesthetizing those animals before you, before you inject them, those kinds of things. Um, so uh, again, consider most common issues and also what, what if uh, an immune compromised person were to be exposed to this, uh, to this biohazardous material. And so once IBC has done a risk assessment, they have four options. They can approve uh, uh, BUA, they can conditionally approve it. Uh, if there are just minor questions that don't really affect the risk assessment, they will conditionally approve it. And once the, the answers to those questions have been obtained, then, then the biosafety office can uh, give final approval. They can table it. If there's not enough information, we don't know what's actually happening, it's unclear, then the IBC will want to see that, that BUA again, or they can deny it. There's no question as to what the researchers are doing. We just think it can't be done safely. Um, and so the IBC will deny it. BOA timeline, uh, the submission deadline is the first day of the month. So it's always on the first. And generally, if it's submitted by the deadline, uh, if the, our, uh, we pre-review those BUAs and we will work with the PIs if, if that is, uh, if there's a healthy communication there, then most likely that BUA will be re reviewed that month. The IBC meets on the fourth Mondays of the month, except in December. Um, that usually gets moved. Um, and the BUAs are, are usually approved for three years. Uh, one exception is human gene transfer BUAs. They're approved uh, for one year and they require annual renewals. Uh, basically, it's because we need to review an annual report associated with that study. So just what do, we have over like 570 BUAs uh, on campus. So what, what does a BUA profile look like? Um, we have a lot of BUAs that have recombinant organisms and that have blood and pathogens in them. We have a lot of BUAs that only require uh, biosafety level one uh, containment. Um, but we, uh, you know, many of these BUAs are amended uh, for additional materials locations or changes in practices or procedure. So we have BUAs from uh, these uh, six uh, colleges or schools at UC Davis. And I, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have some trigger words. If you see any of these in, in grant proposals, uh, those are likely ones that require IBC review. And the, I, the Biosafety Office coordinates with a lot of different groups on campus. Uh, IACUC, IRB, Stem Cell Research Oversight Committee, uh, sponsored programs, uh, other units in the HNS, export control uh, group, the departmental safety coordinators, and even the safety officers uh, purchasing department. Um, for shipping dangerous goods, we work with distribution services. And we also have an outreach for new faculty. Uh, someone in EHNS will, will meet, will try to meet with that PI to uh, give them an overview of what EHNS is about. In the biosafety office, uh, there are a number of people. Uh, so there's me, there's Chelsea Shiano, she's a high containment facility officer. Uh, there's Vivian, Adrian, and Jim are associate biosafety officers, and we also have student employees helping us with some of our tasks. 
And this, if you need to contact the biosafety office, this is a good way to do that, sending an email to biosafety at ucdavis.edu. Any questions? Yep. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lots of information. Um, the, uh, I, I think the biggest take home uh, here is that, I mean, it, it's a complicated area, definitely. Questions, the email address there, you know, contacting them, they are absolutely best resource that you can find in probably the UC system. So uh, thank you very much for it. Um, if there are no more questions, let's keep going. Cindy, I know that she's supposed to be in a meeting in 10 minutes in Sacramento, but let's see what we can do. Let's beam you up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, no pressure on the meetings, right? <laughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about our proposal submission processes, uh, prioritization of our desks, and how we can better work together for greater success and less stress. Uh, less stress being one of the primary reasons I want to have this conversation. Um, I also wanted you to know that we're hearing from your faculty and we're listening to what the faculty tell us. And so this is kind of in response to that. Um, we've had some concerns raised with us about faculty who are actually meeting our five-day timeline, that the proposal is prepared and in a sponsored programs office ready for review five days before it's supposed to be submitted. And some of the frustration of those faculty is, okay, we followed your rules and then my proposal doesn't get reviewed until the day before the deadline or the day of the deadline and then you find something and then suddenly I'm having to scramble, still scramble on the very last day to make those modifications to get my proposal out the door. The dynamic is there because we have so many proposals that are being submitted with less than 48 hours for review and sometimes an hour or two for review that we are constantly scrambling against a deadline. And in the past, what we've said is, we'll do whatever we have to do to not miss a deadline. And I'm going to tell you now that dynamic is changing because we're listening to your faculty and we want to reward those who actually follow our guidelines, <laughs> right? So from a priorities perspective, we've already spoken together as a sponsor programs team. I've spoken with our vice chancellor for research. Uh, about how we can go about this. And we are going to be moving much more in the direction of first in, first out. So I want people to be prepared. Um, if you submit a late proposal, there is no guarantee it's gonna make it out the door because those who arrive before you will get attention before you, regardless of your deadline. Okay? So it kind of, ups the risk a bit. It doesn't mean we won't work on things that are on our plate as quickly and diligently as we possibly can. And if we can meet that, that deadline, we will. But um, if someone came in ahead with, with a proposal that has all of the elements for review, we'll review that ahead. A corollary to this, and we are seeing it more frequently now that we have our system in place. Um, in order to try and get a place in line, people have been submitting what I would call shell proposals. It's really just the routing sheet information. And there is no budget to review. There isn't any like substantive stuff to actually look at. And then a PI will claim, oh, but I submitted it within the five days. No, you did not because we did not have a proposal to actually have enough substance in it to review. So I know um, Ahmed has already started um, we're starting a triage process. So if a proposal comes in and there's no substance there to even review, we're sending it back, all right? So the system will revert it back to you and say, resubmit when it actually has some substance to it. Um, this is how we can better track when a proposal actually arrives in our office, meaning a substantive proposal <laughs> arrives in our office. Um, so we wanted everyone to kind of know about this it is a new dynamic, um, but really it is this feedback so that we can provide better 
service to the ones that meet our guidelines. Any questions on this? Oh, back here and then up here. Yes. Great question. Will an email go out to the faculty? Yes, I'll be working on a communication with uh, Dr. Cameron Carter, uh, hopefully this week, because um, I'll be out of town next week. So uh, we hope to get that out, and it will go via our listserv to your department heads and ask for further dissemination from there. Uh, so they will also be hearing this. Yes. Uh, here? Yes. Okay, so, so the, it was more recommendation than a question uh, that uh, because of this dynamic in sponsor programs, that departments also need to create a strong backbone process that your departmental folks can get done what they need to do on these proposals and get it routed in a timely manner to meet the overall guidelines. I agree. Um, it, it, this does kind of create a dynamic of departments are kind of in between the faculty who are giving you the information and sponsor programs that wants it. <laughs> and so it does put you in that kind of in between spot. So having good guidelines for yourselves and communicating that to your faculty, I think is very important. And then we had Yes. Okay, and first, okay, okay, Cassie. <laughs> okay, so what do I mean by substantive proposal? I'm gonna have Ahmed answer that question. Okay, there, um, aside from the routing sheet that comes through the system, uh, you wanna have scope of work, you wanna have the budget, you want to have budget justification. Scope of work doesn't have to be, that's the science part of it, doesn't have to be complete, final, or whatever, but it has to have enough information in there for us to know uh, what type of uh, work it is. Is it uh, organized research or is it uh, other sponsored activities affecting the FNA? So we need to have that. Um, aside from that, if there's subcontract, you have to have information about the subcontract, you have to have their name, information contact information, their budget, their uh, budget justification, their scope of work. So all of that. And if, um, as uh, uh, Cindy said, definitely the RFP, RFA, you know, whatever it is uh, that is uh, source of the call, we have to have that to review. So you need to have all of that package. Uh, as Cindy said, we have been seeing um, the quote unquote shell proposals coming through, which means that Somebody started something in Kairos, went through all of the uh, routing in the department and department chair said, fine, let's go forward. If they need it, say fine, they said go forward and nothing else is there. Maybe there is a budget there. I have been looking at those. And if that's what it is at this point, I am returning it, which means that you have to go through all that routing again. It, it, you know, it, it, it starts the whole process. At this point, I am returning it. But as we are um, coming up with the process and all of that, we are going to empower the, the analysts to return those. So don't be surprised by that, please. If it is not complete, it would go back, so you would help us. And once it comes back, the clock would start from that time, not when you started you know, six weeks before that. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay.
Okay. Okay, I'll get to that. Um, another item relative to substantive proposal. For those proposals that are being prepared like in the NSF system, right? So it's a different system. Um, and you've routed the, you know, you've routed it through our routing chain in Cayuse, but sponsor programs does not have access to that proposal in that other system to review. Um, we don't have the proposal yet. So the, the timestamp on when we receive that proposal is when you actually give us access to that proposal. So I know sometimes we'll get the Cayuse portion of showing us that you're working on this proposal, but we have no access to it. Um, and we have called or emailed and don't get a response. And then the same day that it's due, even though we have that routing sheet in there that's dated five days prior, we only got to see that proposal the, you know, the day it was due. So that's another aspect that is not system dependent on our campus, but it's um, please give us access to those proposals as early as you possibly can um, in these other government systems if that's how you're doing your proposal. Um, so the other question was, what about times when we might have limited review? Um, and if it's like, if you do submit a proposal on the last day um, and we have 10, 15, 20 proposals all ahead of you that all need to get out that day, uh, again, it's gonna still be first come, first serve uh, on those very last minute proposals. If we don't have time to do a review, we won't. It's literally gonna be, it comes in, we push the button. If it doesn't make it, it doesn't make it. And you will be getting a letter that says, no time for substantive review. This kind of pushes things to the award side of the team then, because if there's issues with indirect costs, like you didn't sufficiently budget indirect costs, likely your budget's going to have to eat the difference, right? We'll set it up with our approved rates and we'll have to adjust. Um, if there were subcontracting issues, that might have to be resolved at the award stage. If there's something in there that we just, we weren't able to check in advance and it makes it so that we can't accept that war award at all, we may have to return awards. Um, one area where I see this is more likely is if it's a contract opportunity where you have to take exception to contract terms before you submit the proposal. If we submit with no review and we didn't take exception and they won't let us change the terms downstream, we may not be able to accept that award. So just be aware of those kinds of, you know, if we have a limited review, there could be downstream ramifications of that, and it could take a lot longer to get your award in place if, in fact, we can accept it. Okay, Associate, with that, mm -hmm. you talked about limited review. Uh, also, you know, the same scenario, lots of other proposals are being worked on by the analysts, and they get something really late. There might be no review, and you would get a message saying that we didn't review it at all, and we push it off to hopefully meet the deadline. Uh, and same issues would come in down the road. When you are successful, uh, that would uh, come in. One other thing that I wanted to mention is that, um, I mean, I'm sure most of you know that like people in the department, most of our uh, proposal analysts are non-exempt, which means that the business hours are eight to five. Uh, we do have you know, some of the exempt people working you know, all hours of the day, uh, but please don't depend on that. I was looking at the, uh, the, you know, the raw thing coming through yesterday from one dean's office around 4.30 yesterday, we got like six, seven proposals coming in for deadline of today. Guess what? We just heard what's going to happen to those proposals today. And it's, it's just the last rotting from dean's office. And it seems like the PIs might have started something like four or five days before, but if the dean's office didn't re release it to us, we don't have it. We got it at 4.30 yesterday. And today is the deadline. Yes, Megan. Is it possible that the button does not get pushed? It is a possibility. That's why we've said there's no guarantee. Um, we're absolutely going to try and push that button if we get it at least 48 hours in advance. Or I should say two business days because sometimes deadlines are on like a Monday. We would need it by Thursday. <laughs> um, so 
we're absolutely going to try and, and get it if we have at least two business days to process it. Um, but if you're below that two day mark, no guarantees. There could be times when simply the, the deadline is missed. Um, so I, th that's, that's, the, that's what I'm trying to <laughs> express to folks. Yes. So most campuses I've been dealing with lately have a strict 10 day rule. So the five day rule is actually very generous. And I just wanted to put that out there um, if anyone has complaints. <laughs> Thank you very much. Regarding that again, the last minute pushing the button, whatever that means, uh, let's assume that you know, we go through all of what we are talking about. The proposal came in at, at 2 p.m. today by the time that, by the way, one other thing that you know, people think that if they think the routing was done by 2, you know, 2 p.m., let's say, uh, our analyst sees it at Two and one minute after that, it it no, it won't happen. It's just by the time the analyst would see that, it probably is four p.m. So when that happens, if that proposal is pushed through, let's assume it's grants.gov type of thing, and it comes back with twenty errors, There's I don't no think anybody's sitting it. there to watch that, because they are working on some other proposals. So by the time that anybody sees those errors, probably it's after five. And you missed the deadline. Now I want to talk about what I would desire to see as a future state. If we can fix this same day, very late proposal dynamic that we are seeing, because I'll tell you right now, and one of the reasons we're bringing this to your attention is because I would say the majority, the vast majority of proposals are arriving the day before or the same day. This is putting tremendous pressure on our team. We can get 150 proposals in for one deadline. And some people say, well, does it really take you five days to review a proposal? No, but it does take us five days to review 150 of them, right? So, so that's why this has become so important is that the volume is such that we just really need that time in order to review those proposals, make sure we can get a good product that goes out the door. So, one of my desires is if we can shift this dynamic and now the majority are coming in with five days to review, it frees up that stress, right? <laughs> it allows potentially some time in an analyst's day that if you have a proposal that you'd like feedback on and it's not in the routing process yet, our system now allow, allows our analysts to see that proposal before it actually gets to us they could actually proactively assist and do budget reviews and feedback before you even go into routing. But it's only if they've already handled the stuff, you know, that, that has been officially routed and, and it's been processed. And if they have time, then they can do that pre-review. I know some of our analysts have been asked to do that pre-review before something's gone into process. And what I've said is don't drop the ones that are already here in order to look at the ones that aren't, right? But if they have the, the work handled because we've changed this whole kind of deadline dynamic, um, we very well could be providing much better proactive support to your, to your departments so that when it does get to SPO, it's clean, you know, and they know, okay, yeah, I already saw this one. Let's push the button and go. Yeah. The goal is to get more approved grants. Yeah. So there's a suggestion online that I really, really want to share because I think it's a good one. Um, Gwen has suggested that, so whenever you're preparing your internal processing forms, your proposals in CAIUS SP, and you need to submit them for routing, we need them in sponsored programs five days in advance of the deadline, as Cindy has mentioned. But when you push that button, submit for routing, it still has to go through the routing and approval process. So you still have to get the approvals done by your admin unit, department chair or director, your PIs and co-PIs home units. So Gwen suggested that instead of pushing that button five days, five business days in advance, maybe you want to do seven or even more to make sure that you can get that 
that approval done. So I know we were going to talk about it later, but we had it recommended by one of our department admins. So I wanted to share that. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you all. <laughs> um, I think this is something we just all need to really work on together. And I know it's driven initially by faculty and what they can get to you when they get it to you. But um, it would be really great if we can really start to move the dial on this and change some of the dynamics. So thank you. Thank you. You have one minute to make it second. Exactly like <laughs> thank you, Cindy. Uh, James, do you want to talk about whatever update from accounting? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got something, I've got two things rather quick to, uh, to run by you all. Um, both of them relate to the single audit from fiscal 16 um, that we've talked about before, but I want to just throw them out there again. One had to do with the key personnel uh, finding where we have now implemented a monitoring process. So we kicked that off. I think I mentioned this last time we were together. Um, <clears throat> so just again, quickly, the process is on a quarterly basis, we look at budget periods that ended in the prior quarter. So what we just did was for the quarter of October, November, December of 17, we looked in our system at any situation where we have captured somebody as a key personnel, and we're including PIs in that definition of key personnel, where we don't see either a, a salary charges coming through in accordance with what the, the effort commitment was, or we don't see any cost share coming through. We created a list, we sent that out to everyone and said, please look, these are your folks that don't seem like they're lining up, please look at this and make sure that you've got, you know, you, you make the necessary adjustments, or you have uh, figured out where that effort really is going to come in to be in compliance with whatever commitment level is, um, or perhaps go back to the sponsor and get approval for making those changes. That initial list that goes out on the first month uh, in January, for example, for the quarter ending in December, um, that is for your information to review. You do not need to provide feedback to us to contracts and grants accounting. It's coming out under my name, um, James Ringo contracts and grants accounting. Um, but then we do a follow-up, which, which we just did, um, which is a, a random sampling of the list we'd already sent out saying, okay, now you've been selected to actually prove to us that you are in compliance one way or another with the key personnel commitments. Does that make sense? Have you all seen, many of you have seen those notices going out? Okay, so that was one thing that, that was from the, um, that audit. Um, the second is, and, and we talked about it before, but there's a little wrinkle that came up. It has to do with PRECs, with payments that we're making on our subrecipient agreements. There was a, without getting into the weeds a lot, th there was a little bit of a problem with the payment terms that were being associated with the invoices that were being paid we need the payment terms to be net because that affects when we're gonna go and pull cash associated with that. If, you, if it's tagged for net 30 perhaps, what happens in the system is as soon as the document is approved, it posts to the ledger and my cash team goes and pulls down that $100,000 or that half million. These are big, typically these are large payments that are going out to our subrecipients. We go and pull down that cash, but the disbursement to the subrecipient is held until it hits that 30 day or 15 day or whatever it is. So that creates this problem where the auditors are saying, wait a minute, you, you pulled federal money down, but you didn't push that out. We went through and did a mass update and corrected, updated, let's say, the, um, the NPA slash PO document to to be net, so we tried to control there. What we came to learn recently is the users can override that. So whoever initiates the PREC can override what we've set to net. So leave it at net, that's, that's the bottom one, leave it at net. We may need, if, if, if we see these, and it looks like there's a big time discrepancy between when something might get approved and where that 
disbursements could happen, we may need to cancel those PREX and have either you or the invoice processing center put it back in and leave it at net. We're looking at trying to do a system, you know, a little business rule so that we don't run into that. But for right now, just in the back of, you know, no, in the front of your mind, not in the back of your, front of your mind, we want net. Um, those were the two things. You know, again, this goes back to the single audit from fiscal 16. We were not selected for fiscal 17. Fiscal 17 audit should be published next week, I think is where they're looking at publishing it uh, on the OP, UCOP website. Um, but since we weren't in the fiscal 17 audit, there's a real high probability we will be selected for fiscal 18 and they will always go back and look at what happened in prior findings and find out how we're doing currently in addition to whatever other testing they're they're doing so that's what i had to throw at you mike did you have anything that you want to mention that so um we had a um, request from usda for three specific entities um units of USDA, it was um, ARS, Agricultural Research Service, ARS, ERS, which is the Economic Research Service, and the National Agricultural Statistics Service, NASS. We are in the process of sending notifications out for those of you that have these agreements in your, in your units. Um, the USDA has said there's a records disposal freeze so you can't destroy any records associated with these projects. So those communications will probably go out today, hopefully today or certainly this week. One note about that, the date of that announcement is February 8th. They say effective immediately, do not destroy any of the documents associated with those uh, programs. Uh, we have already uh, stopped uh, getting rid of uh, documents which are past uh, the retention period in our office. Uh, so we are complying with that. And as you said, you, know, you want to send a message to, to the PIs. But in, in our office, the last um, disposal of anything related to these things has been at the end of January. So even so we can verify at this point that at the date that uh, that message came out, February 8th, actually a week before that, we have stopped uh, getting rid of, rid of records still they tell us what the reason is. They haven't told us the reason by the way at this point across the country there are there's a lot of discussions going on on this trying to figure out what it is and what we should be doing but uh, that's the order from government and that's what we have to find. Yeah and similarly in accounting we, as soon as we got the letter we, we stopped any central office records disposed. Right. Uh, we just want to get it out broadly so that everyone is aware of it. Um, that's what I have, any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, do we have any updates from, what well, we talked a lot about things from sponsored programs and the proposals and uh, logistics of all of that. If you have any questions, let me know, send me an email, give me a call or whatever. I'm sorry? Uh, we'll get that to the agenda in a second. Do you have uh, uh, anything on the proposals? Our proposal team is good. Nothing, no updates on the proposals. Thank you. There's a big deadline today that you are trying on the end of the month and all of that. Brian on the award side, any updates? Thank you. So just a few brief updates. Uh, the first one is regarding a question came in online asking if there's any deadlines for amendments. And I, I guess that question goes to like if, if uh, you get an amendment in your department, is there a deadline for submitting it in Cayuse? Um, so if you do get an amendment, just send it to awards at ucdavis.edu. Don't submit it through Cayuse. So if it's an agreement amendment, just email us and we will tell you what needs to be submitted in Cayuse if anything needs to be submitted in Cayuse. Usually there does not need to be anything submitted for a, an amendment like a no cost extension or something like that. So just send it to awards at ucdavis.edu and our staff will assess it and let you know what is needed. Um, another update, um, so FOIA requests, so Freedom of Information Act requests, if you get one concerning um, an agreement you have, um, send it to awards at ucdavis.edu and we will handle it accordingly. Please don't respond to the FOIA request. Please don't have your investigator respond to it and disclose the information. Send it to uh, sponsored programs and we will uh, address it accordingly. 
And then uh, finally, the California model agreement, the model agreement that's uh, in place between uh, you know, all the state agencies and CSU and UC, um, the model terms and conditions in there um, is going to be updated to version three in March. So, so tomorrow, I guess. Um, there's not really many big updates. Um, they're just renumbering some things and they're adding a, um, a section saying that we have to be a harassment-free workplace, which obviously we strive to do. Um, so that, that's it. Thank you. Any questions from either here or online? No? The COI people are not here. So we did have a question regarding if designated assistants can, can complete the online COI forms. I don't think so, but no one from COI is here today to address that. If you go to their website, they do have user guides that you can find information for on how to use those programs or contact um, them because they are a separate office and they're not here today. But I don't think so I think that the PIs have got to do their absolutely, disclosures that, themselves. That, that absolutely, absolutely is true. Um, at least for um, the uh, 700 of you, I can tell you that uh, you know it, that I know where the signature is. The PI under penalty of perjury is saying that I, I am answering all these questions and this is why it is. Uh, no, a, a department you know, person should not get in the middle of that and answer those questions for the PI, even if the PI says, answer them, then I'll sign it. If they would ask me to do that, I wouldn't do that. That's, that you know, is done under the penalty of perjury. And if there's something wrong there, and somebody other than the PI is doing it, you are taking responsibility for that. And there are huge consequences, especially on 700, you, I know for a fact, and you have, might have heard from me several times, the person who was the governor who signed that um, law, which starts 700 U, that was Governor Brown in his first round, almost went to jail on the same law himself later. Um, and that had to do with, um, again, you guys have heard you know, from me about this, way past that, you know that Governor Brown, who is just you know, right now still the governor, at one point was the uh, mayor of Oakland. And he did great work in Oakland to clean up some of the areas that they weren't that desirable. As a part of his cleanup, he bought a condo in that same area that he was trying to improve and bring investment in all of that. The allegation against him was that uh, that, that benefited his condo's price, I mean price increase. He should have declared on the equivalent of 700 U.S. for public officials is 700. And he hadn't done that. And the lower court found him guilty and luckily, you know, the, at the appeal level, they said this is crazy. So that, that law has a lot of power behind it. Do not get in the middle of it. Absolutely not get in the middle of it. Do not answer those questions for your PRs. Similar type of things can happen at the federal level, but I know that at state level, that's why it is. So that hopefully is a long answer to your short question. Do not get involved. Anything else? Well, if there is nothing else, we can stop. It's 15 minutes before 10. Thank you very much for showing up. Meet, see you next month.